that's a part of ethics is the consumer is able to make an educated decision. And so I think it's a, it's a very complex question because I think it really comes down to many variables. Um, and then ultimately, I think it comes down to both the person producing pornography and the person consuming that pornography, that they need to know all of the risks involved so that they can make an ethical and educated decision. Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. Today's episode, I'm sitting down with Garrett Johnson. He is a presenter and the podcast developer over at Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization working to inform people about the harmful effects of pornography. Uh, We have a really good conversation, and we talk a lot about some of the research that they've done uh, and the thousands of articles they've done since starting in 2010. And again, this is not something we're going to come at this from a religious perspective. This is purely from research. And I tried to ask questions that went both ways, that asked uh, about maybe some misconceptions from the side of people who are anti-porn industry, from people who um, are for the porn industry. We talk a lot about uh, the rise and uptick of people self-producing porn for sites like OnlyFans, in addition to uh, the overreach and kind of sketchy contracts from production companies. And so it's a really good conversation. Definitely listen through all the way to the end. Uh, Garrett is a um, bicycle rider in his off time. He's ridden uh, 3,800 miles across the country. Uh, he's run 30 marathons in 30 days. And he um, doesn't give up easily, but insists that raising children requires more stamina, loves the outdoors, road trips, and fighting for love. And as one of Uh, Fight the New Drugs veteran presenters. He's spoken to more than 160 audiences from around the globe about the harmful effects of porn and is now working on the launch of Fight the New Drugs first ever podcast, which uh, just launched recently, actually. Um, And they've had some amazing guests like Terry Crews. They've had uh, Marisol Nichols on the show. Uh, Some really amazing content over there. So definitely check that out. But before we get into the show, if you want to support the mission of the Preacher Boys podcast, if you want to help make it possible for more research, more incredible guests, Uh, more content, and obviously all the upkeep on the abuser database, definitely consider supporting the show through Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash preacher boys. It's patreon.com slash preacher boys, or you can visit preacherboys.com and click over to the tab that says support the show. You can give through PayPal or you can give through Patreon. Uh, This wouldn't be possible without the support we have so far. It's allowed me to put out uh, more episodes, focus more on the video side of the show, and really make this a really incredible project, exposing abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. But all right, guys, with that out of the way, let's get into my interview with Garrett Johnson. Garrett, can you just introduce yourself really quickly and maybe tell us a couple of facts about you before we get started? Yeah, my name is Garrett Johnson, and a couple of facts about myself is, well, I'm here today because I work with an organization called Fight the New Drug. Um, that's enough, one fact. I guess uh, another fact about me is that I have, uh, I have a partner and we have three kids together. So cool. life is um, busy and good. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so uh, fight the new drug. I know I gave a little bit of context in the intro of the episode and I've known about you guys for quite a while. Um, actually the first time I ever clicked over to your site was because I saw your shirt designs and I was like, Oh, those are super cool. What are those? And then I started like actually reading the mission, which is pretty cool as well. But, um, so fight the new drug is a non-religious organization that is essentially telling people about the, the studies and dangers of pornography. And I was surprised that you guys weren't a religious organization uh, because most of the anti-pornography positions you think of, you know, coming from the pulpit, you think of, you know, kind of this 
you know, clutching your pearls kind of <laughs> Puritan culture of like, you know, hey, let's go against this. So if it's not for a religious reason, what's motivating all this effort, time, resources into telling people about this, uh, about this problem? Yeah, so uh, Fight the New Drug was founded in 2010. And at the time, there were several organizations that were doing, uh, building awareness about the harmful effects of pornography. But we saw that there was a need um, And when I say we, I'm not one of the founders, but the founders saw that there was a need and they decided that the way to um, have the broadest audience was going to be to approach it from a non-religious and non-legislative perspective. And so, yeah, our our organization is non-religious and non-legislative, meaning that we are not trying to ban pornography Um, And if you scroll through our site, we have thousands of blog posts, um, all sorts of different resources, and you'll never hear us refer to or reference morals or or religion. Right. Um, And I think to us, it comes down to being, it's about being a responsible citizen. Mm. Um, And back in 2010, we've, we've now celebrated 10 years as a registered 501c3. And one of the cool things to look at is in that time frame during that two, uh, during those 10 years, um, there have been over 15 states that have declared pornography a public health concern. Wow. And so I think that, uh, yeah, religious or not, um, or no matter what your pit- political persuasion is or religion is or isn't, um, the harmful effects of pornography don't discriminate. And so we were trying to tailor this and package package this message to that audience, to, to everyone. Right, right. Yeah, I definitely want to get into the effects and so on. Um, but before we go deeper in the discussion, I'm curious. So what when you guys say porn, you know, there's a lot of varying degrees of what people consider that, especially within religious circles. You know, I, I grew up hearing that, you know, Amber Crombie and Fitch catalogs were were pornographic and um you know some people consider you know sex scene in a movie to be porn um obviously then you have like internet pornography so when you guys describe porn what what, what's your definition or what is it specifically that you're focusing in on yeah it's funny that you should ask that because we actually um don't define it in Hmm. if you look through our site you'll you'll see that we we don't define it Um, And I think the reason why that is, is because of the exact point you're making, that it can be subjective and that it lacks some parameters on that definition. Right. Um, There's a famous quote by, I think his name's Potter Stewart. And um, he said that he used this quote when he was trying to identify or label something that was subjective. And the quote is, you know it when, I know it when I see it. Right. And so we kind of leave that up to every person. Um, They can kind of decide they know it when they see it kind of thing. Every person's different. Um, But I will say this, that um, I can talk to kind of what pornography um, or I guess what types of pornography there are. It can come in the form of audio, um, video, pictures. Um, Another form of pornography that is currently happening frequently is sexting. Um, and so, and then there's, there's legal forms of pornography, and then there's illegal forms of pornography. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think what we really try to focus on though, is like mainstream internet porn, right? That's kind of the main focus. I know okay. that's a broad definition. I didn't even define it, but yeah, I think, oh, but that, I think the, uh, the average person listening knows exactly what you're talking about for sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if a person, if a young teen was to go and search for something innocently or with the intention of seeking out pornography, what they find is, I guess, kind of the way you could define pornography would be that. What are they finding for free? Got it. Okay. So, um, so there, I think there's very few that would argue like, okay, children should be consuming porn or, or teens should be consuming porn. But, um, you know, there's a lot of information you guys have put out about how it's, it is harmful for adults and, and studies and the way that your brain literally restructures when consuming porn. So 
what, what are some of maybe the, you know, two or three studies or, or facts that you've found that are pretty shocking as far as how porn affects the brain? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of research. Um, the brain in general, um, it's a weird thing because there's this ongoing debate right now if pornography should be considered or included in the DSM. And I'm sure you're familiar with the DSM. And so there's, there's people that say it shouldn't be included. There's people that say it should be included. And currently it's not included in the DSM. Um, but there are very, very credible organizations and individuals who um, are studying this and researching it. And um, a couple of things that can show um, as evidence that, that it is harmful to the brain is the World Health Organization. They do recognize something that they have defined as compulsive sexual behavior. Hmm. And so it is recognized there. The DSM, or excuse me, the World Health Organization, it's called the, um, um, the ICD. The ICD-11 recognizes compulsive sexual behavior. So that to, to have the World Health Organization include compulsive sexual behavior as um, a diagnosis, it shows that this is potentially harmful. Right. Um, another researcher that comes to mind is Dr. Valerie Voon, and she's the lead researcher at Cambridge University in the UK. And she performed um, some research recently, and the research showed there was 19 patients that were healthy, or excuse me, 19 volunteers that were healthy, and 19 patients that were um, that had been diagnosed with compulsive sexual behavior. Hmm. And they put them under an fMRI machine and looked at their brain activity as they were shown explicit images and other types of images of different things. And the quote that I want to use, um, she said that at the end of the study, she said that there are clear differences in the brain activity between healthy patients or healthy volunteers and patients with compulsive sexual behavior. Hmm. And those differences mirror those of drug addicts. There, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of research showing that it, it can be harmful to the brain. Um, that's just a couple of pieces of, of evidence or research that show that, yeah, this is something we should be paying attention about and right. um, paying attention to and educating about. Interesting. So th this kind of ties in, and I didn't, I didn't send you this question beforehand, uh, so sorry for an off-the-cuff question, but, uh, you know, I... For me, like the idea of, and maybe this is because I come from a creative background, I'm putting out content and things like that. Like the, I grade against the idea of like censorship and the idea that, you know, I think that, you know, you know, quote unquote, bad people are going to do bad things when it comes to violence in video games or movies and um, people with, you know, disorders are going to be drawn to material that's unhealthy for them. But um, just kind of playing the devil's advocate role here, like for someone who maybe, um, you know, has a compulsive uh, sex disorder and they, they are constantly searching out things to fulfill that need. Um, is it, is it, how do you define whether or not porn is fueling that or whether it's something that they're going to porn to fulfill something that's already inside them? You know what I mean? Like that's something that when I think about, cause I, you, you always hear like, Oh, was a shooting inspired by a video game or something like that. And we tend to say, Oh, it's that person had a problem and was fueled by something they consumed. Um, where do you draw that line and how does your, how do the studies you guys have found delineate those two things? Yeah, I think that, um, well, if you go to psychology 101, right, it's going to say that correlation is not causation. And so I think that's kind of what you're referring to is that, um, there are many variables that play into someone's decision to turn to pornography. But if you look at pornography itself, I guess going back to that study with Valerie Voon, um, one of the interesting things about that study is that the participants often reported wanting it more, but enjoying it less. Um, so they, they wanted pornography more, but they enjoyed it less. Right. And so I think that can, that can show, uh, it's a piece of evidence showing that these people are consuming a, an addictive, it's not a substance. You're not putting a new substance into the, into the body, like a, a drug or like, right. like alcohol, for example. But um, if you look at, for example, gambling, um, I think like 2.5 million people fit the criteria 
every year for gambling disorder wow. and gambling disorder is included in the DSM. Um, and gambling is, is similar to pornography in some ways because you're not putting a new chemical into the body. Right. But there are these substances or behaviors um, that, that trigger the brain in similar ways that other drugs do. Right. Well, and, and even so, though you're, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, and even though you're not necessarily injecting a foreign chemical, you are releasing, I know you're, you're releasing dopamine hits. You're doing, um, I believe it was through you guys I'd read a long time ago that like the same part of your brain lights up that does when you're consuming a drug or, or something that gives you a rush or a, a positive or at least seemingly positive feeling uh, when you're consuming. So you are yeah. releasing, you're releasing things in your brain that do feel good at the time. Yeah. And I guess the same, but one of the skeptic, like uh, someone that's skeptical about um, fight the new drug or that statement you just made, they might say, well, a puppy dog is going to activate the same mm. part of the brain right. um, because everything happens with, whenever you feel pleasure, that's happening inside the limbic system, inside the reward pathway. And so whether you are gaming or hanging out with your partner or eating at your favorite restaurant or like playing fetch with a dog, all those enjoyments are happening within the same part of the brain. Mm. But there is, there's a lot of studies showing that the buildup of a chemical called Delta Fos B, um, that the buildup of this or the accumulation of Delta Fos B in the brain has been identified as a molecular switch for mm. addiction. And so, um, that's something that happens with pornography consumption is the buildup of Delta Fos B. Right. And so, yeah, we, there's a lot of studies that, that show that it is building that chemical up. Whereas like a puppy dog for most people isn't going to build up uh, an accumulated amount of Delta Fos B. Right. So it's essentially when you say a switch, it's essentially restructuring your brain to need something as opposed to it just the pure pleasure of it, which, yeah. which I think most of the arguments for it is, oh, it's, you know, it's once in a while, or it's, you know, some people say, oh, it's with my spouse. And it's, you know, it, it, you know, all these different things that people say, it tends to just allude to it as being like, oh, it's a, it's just a quick pleasure. It's like playing a video game, or it's like watching a movie or anything else. Yeah, um, there's some, there's certain behaviors and certain substances that you never feel satiated with. And I think right. that's one of the key differences. If you think about eating broccoli and almonds, you're not going to, the, the most people aren't going to overconsume broccoli and almonds because right. you feel satiated. You're getting yeah. nutrients. Now replace broccoli and almonds with Doritos and something sugary. Mm -hmm. And then the ability to eat the satiation, it's, it's, it's more challenging. It takes longer for the satiation to mm -hmm. arrive um, if it ever does. And right. so I think pornography is similar. It's a behavior that um, the satiation um, is going to, it's going to be more challenging to reach satiation. Right. Yeah. I can relate to that example because I just started dieting and I <laughs> trying to quit, <laughs> I trying to quit Red Bull is a lot easier than trying to like slow down on broccoli for sure. <laughs> but, sure. Um, but yeah, so, so even beyond how it impacts the brain, like there's a lot of just like social ramifications. So like, I know, um, trafficking is one thing that even people who are pro the porn industry, you know, know it's a problem and, and um, you know, trafficking has gotten a lot of attention with the Jeffrey Epstein document that just came out. Uh, porn hubs hit the headlines a lot uh, for different, um, you know, there's a 15 year old girl who was missing, who was identified in 58 videos. Uh, you've got um, an entire channel that was very popular on the site that got shut down because they were forcing girls into the sex acts. And so, um, and Pornhub is like the biggest porn site. Like that should be the Walmart of, if there should be a safe porn site, that should be it. So um, how, how linked really are the porn industry and trafficking? Like, is there a very clear connection there? Is it something that's a, you know, kind of a horror story that, you know, it's a small minority that we hear a lot about? Uh, how connected are those two things? It's tough to say exactly how connected because um, it, a lot of this stuff happens underground. Right. And so it's tough to say exactly how connected they are. But I, I will say that it's safe to say that they are inseparably connected. Right. And um, if, I think it's important to define trafficking 
um, mm. according to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act that was passed in 2000. Um, it is a commercial sex act induced by force, fraud, or coercion. So mm. you used the word forced when you were talking about that specific um, site. You didn't mention the exact site, but I know which one you're talking about. Right. That was um, that has been um, convicted of. Yeah, they actually went to prison. Yeah. Yeah. And the owner, if I'm not mistaken, the owner of that company is still on the run. He's a fugitive. Wow. The FBI is looking for him. And I think he lives in New Zealand. So I think mm. it's possible that he fled to New Zealand. But um, yeah, they, there was that's a good example of coercion. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes when people think about sex trafficking, they think about the movie taken. Yeah. And um, there's some big organizations. One of them is like the Polaris project and they fight human trafficking. And one of the myths that they try to break is that sex trafficking is always a violent crime. Um, and the reality is, is that most sex trafficking happens you the, the traffickers use psychological means to manipulate and trick and defraud victims. Right. And so this site that you're referring to is an example where these girls were coursed, forced, um, whatever the case may be in, in their particular situations, but then um, they sign an agreement mm -hmm. with this company. And then this company, in this case, they were um, breaking the agreement in many cases and then this internet because of mainstream internet pornography today the the pornographic climate out there these girls are re-victimized every time that someone views this content and it's nearly impossible to get all of it taken down off right. the internet right just like anything on the internet that's it's once it's there it's kind of there um yeah. yeah i think it's good you you mentioned that and you know I think the word force is applicable, but it is important to say like, um, I think it's hard for people to grasp like, well, it's not everybody's held at gunpoint and told to do A, B, and C. But um, I just watched a BBC interview with uh, Mia Khalifa, who was like a, I mean, she was a massive um, name is always trending. And um, she, she spoke about, it. she's become a very big advocate against uh, the porn industry. And um, you know, she, she talks about that. The fact that there's, there's videos out of her, every single video that's out, she wishes she could take down, but because of contracts, she didn't understand as a 20, I think or maybe even younger. I think she was 20, she's 26 now. Um, but the fact that she has all these videos, she wants taken down that she can't because of all these contracts. She talks about, um, you know, going into the studio. It felt like, you know, she saw deaths with, you know, people's pictures of their family. She saw very chill. She thought it was going to be fine. And it was just a slow, gradual progression into doing these scenes. And, and she says, she says, I didn't, it's not that they would have forced me to do it, but I couldn't say no. And that's a weird, it's just a weird way to think about it because there is, there's so much psychological pressure, you know, and they did, um, in her story, she talks about, they preyed on her insecurities. They preyed on her um, needing of acceptance at that time in her life and uh, forced her to do things that, I mean, especially because of her religious background, she, she told them, she said, you're gonna get me killed doing some of this stuff. The stares I get, I feel like people can see through my clothes and it brings me deep shame. It, it makes me feel like, it makes me feel like uh, I lost all right to my privacy which I did because I'm one Google search away. Yeah. And it, those images, you cannot expunge. No. You have no right, even though it is deeply personal to you, you have no right to, to remove them from anybody's view around the world. Yeah. It is very hard. It is. And I'm just thinking, this isn't, I mean, this story is your story, but frankly, it, it's also the story of other porn actors and actresses. I honestly started seeing that recently after the interview came out and people started reaching out and uh, all of the emails go, my, my manager checks them. And when he gets stuff like that, he filters them and sends them to me. And reading the words of some of these girls who have been sex trafficked and forced into porn and all of these stories of girls whose lives have been ruined by it and by men who have taken advantage of them and by 
contracts that they didn't even, didn't even understand the jargon of. It, it makes me feel like, okay, maybe, maybe it was good that I started talking and that right. I posted this interview and that I'm speaking out now because other people feel the same way. And even if they don't relate on a, as deep a level as you know, doing porn, they can relate on the level of being insecure and being pressured into doing something they right. didn't want to do. You were wearing the Islamic headscarf, often known as hijab, and of course then it developed into a sort of a sex scene. You must have known how provocative that was. I verbatim told them, you guys are going to get me killed. And they said? They just laughed. Why didn't you then say, I'm not doing it? Intimidation. I was scared. But I, I, I knew that if I said no, it would, it would, you know, they're not, you can, they, they're not going to force you to do it. That's, at that point, that's rape. No one's going to force mm. you to have sex. Um, but I was still scared. I mean, I, have you ever felt scared to, not scared, but nervous to speak up and say something at a restaurant when your food's not right and the waiter comes by and says, how is everything? I, I was intimidated. I was nervous. But for them, it was, it was profiting off of her and, and uh, getting exposure because of her. And she walked away with, I mean, not even financial gain. She walked away with literally nothing. So yeah, I think when you say the word force, I think it's good that you clarify there's, you know, you hear the stuff about, oh, they get them addicted to drugs or they get them to do this because of violence. But probably the vast majority, it's sketchy contracts and manipulation and playing on the emotions of the people involved. And so I think it's good you you clarify that. Um, so um, with, you know, so we have trafficking and and, you know, the idea of like, you know, these companies that are being doing very sketchy things. And even, like I said, Pornhub is one of the biggest companies and they've had plenty of uh, headlines the last year or so. But especially now with COVID, you know, I see places like Vice reporting about, you know, OnlyFans seeing upticks in, in users. And there's kind of this, it seems like in the articles I'm reading that there's a sense of perceived safety and change in the porn industry in the sense of people are producing on their own. They're controlling how much they make, how much they work. They're, you know, they don't have to be with another performer that they don't want to be. Um, and so is there any legitimacy to the idea of like ethical porn, quote unquote, and, um, you know, it's, you avoid all of the kind of sketchy, scary parts that come with like having a production company, do, do you see any positive change in that route? Do you think it's a problem that we're just seeing production increasing? Uh, what's kind of your thoughts on that and that development in this world? So if you, I did this recently just to see the number. If you Google just the word porn, you're going to get like, at least as the time, at the time that I did it, it was like 1,840,000,000 results in That's like crazy. one second. And, um, so I don't think, I don't think we need more pornography. <laughs> um, I think we got enough. <laughs> we, yeah. We got a good database. That being said, we're not trying to ban it. Um, yeah. we want people to have freedom of choice, but we also want people just like it says in our, in our mission statement, we want people to be able to be informed, to make an educated decision. And so I think when it comes to ethical porn, quote unquote, I think there needs to be some digging and understanding to really um, make an educated decision on that. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples that comes to mind is a person that I just spoke with recently. His name's Jose Alfaro, and um, he was trafficked. His case is very unique because he actually, his trafficker went to, was convicted. Hmm. And so um, a lot of victims of and survivors of sex trafficking never see that day when their trafficker is convicted. And so his case is rare in that way. Um, and one thing that happened after his trafficking was that he was doing camming. Hmm. And that's similar to the site you mentioned, or like you mentioned uh, fans only, right? Yeah. Or only fans. And um Camming is similar to that where you don't need a production company. You're doing it in the 
in your own house. And the experience that Jose had, it's tough for me to speak to because I've never done that. It's never been part of my life. Um, so maybe I'm not the best one to speak to this, but um, he mentioned that his drug use and alcohol use was high during these times mm. when he was camming. Um, and so I think that he was in an unhealthy spot. Um, another thing is that he felt like he was doing it to provide for himself. Um, if he was, if he had the option of a different career, he would have taken that option. But, uh, so that's what we call survival sex where the person has no other options. And so they're going to, um, take this option for financial reasons. Um, so I think those are a couple things to consider, uh, another thing to consider when we talk about like quote unquote ethical porn is like for something to, I think that it's important that individuals, the consumers are um, making educated decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the thing is like, if you look at the tobacco industry, for example, like in 1925, there was a tobacco company called Lucky Strike and yeah. they were advertising their cigarettes to like grab a cigarette instead of grabbing a sweet. It was like a mm. diet kind of thing. Relax and light up a better tasting Lucky Strike. You'll find that Luckies do taste better and for good reasons. First, LSMFT. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And then that fine, good tasting tobacco is toasted. It's toasted to taste even better, cleaner, fresher, smoother. So light up a Lucky. You'll say it's the best tasting cigarette you ever smoked. For the taste that you like, light up a Lucky Strike. Right now. Light up a Lucky. It's light up time. And then if you fast forward to 1994, and the tobacco industry was still denying that tobacco was addictive. And then you fast forward to today, and people are able to make an educated decision. And to me, that's part of ethical of, that's a part of ethics this is the consumer is able to make an educated decision. And so I think it's a, it's a very complex question because I think it really comes down to many things, many variables. Um, and then ultimately I think it comes down to both the person producing pornography and the person consuming that pornography that they need to know all of the risks involved um, so that they can make an ethical and, and educated decision. Right. I don't know if that answers your question, but no, just some thoughts I had on that. It, it does. And um, I, I guess I'll, I, I'll kind of phrase this a little bit just to kind of push it a little bit further. But I mean, obviously you're non-legislative, but you understand the harm um, that's here. And, and I mean, obviously you guys have been doing this for, for so long, uh, trying to educate people. So you want to give people freedom of choice. You're not trying to ban it. So what, what is the goal? Is it, is it, is there anything that you'd like to see happen? I mean, obviously you guys are putting the word out and things like that. Um, but you know, cigarettes have a surgeon general's warning, you know, there's, um, all these different, um, you know, you're not allowed to advertise, uh, in certain places. Is there anything like that or any, uh, would you like to see this in sex ed in public schools? Like, is there, what would you like to see happen in an ideal world where people are well-informed and can make good decisions? What would need to change in the kind of current climate? Yeah, the sex ed part is tough to answer because that would jump into legislation. Right. Um, but what we would like to see, I guess, if we look at a study that was performed pretty recently by the BBFC, they did uh, some research with about 2,500 participants. Some of them are adolescents, some of them are adults. And the numbers, if I'm remembering correctly, the numbers are like 51% of 11 to 13 year olds reported that they had been exposed to pornography at some point. And then that number jumped to 66% of 14 to 15 year olds. Um, and then 62% of that first number I mentioned, the 51% of 11 to 13 year olds, 62% of that group um, stumbled upon pornography accidentally. Yeah. They weren't seeking it out. And so in that same study, 83% of parents in that study reported that they would um, support, they think that online age verification should mm. be in play right. for pornography. And so I think that's one thing that could be very um, healthy for yeah. society is that online age verification. 
And so to answer your question, that's one thing that we could do. I think that ultimately kids and adults are going to do, if there, if there's a will, there's a way kind of thing. Yeah. So I think ultimately it really does come down to education. If you think about, um, there's, there's positive correlations and negative correlations. And an example of that would be like a positive correlation is if someone um, is taller, usually they weigh more, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a positive correlation, higher, bigger, and more height, more weight. A negative correlation is example, an example of a negative correlation would be like flossing. The more you floss that increases, then cavities decrease. And so I think that what we can do with education, I think it can, I think the more education is going to lead to an increased amount of healthy decision-making. So I think in my opinion, and, uh, and what we try to do at Fight the New Drug is simply educate using science facts and personal accounts so that that positive correlation can increase so that people can consider before consuming and um, therefore make a healthier decision for themselves. Yeah, I think that's important. And I, I talked to you a little bit about this beforehand is like, I, so I grew up in very heavy kind of purity culture. You, you didn't talk about sex like at all, except for when they were saying, don't look at porn and don't have sex. Um, but that's not, you know, when you're, uh, you know, getting in teenage years and you're like, have all these questions and nobody's talking right. to you, it becomes a little bit tricky. But, um, you know, like my my first exposure to porn was probably sixth grade so whatever however old you are fifth or sixth grade 12. uh yeah so like 12. yeah 11 or 12 so the number that you said um and yeah the first times were accidents and then you know and then very quickly it's oh my friend showed me this and you know and i think it's safe to say most of the people that i knew growing up had the same trajectory as i did and not again not because like i didn't even know I knew porn was a bad word from the pulpit. Like you don't, you don't look at it, but I didn't even know where to find it or what it was, or it was just this like kind of nebulous threat out, out there. Um, and so I think if I would have just had some information for when like, Oh, you see something, how do you identify it? What is it? And go talk to somebody. I think that would have been really helpful. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't till I was probably, 16 or 17 that I like actually went to my dad and was like, Hey, like now this is a problem. And it's been, you know, all these years just building up of exposure to this. Um, and at that point it's a lot harder to like deal with it because at that point you are on this big trajectory of just like consuming, consuming, consuming. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the education side's really important. Um, but I'm, I'm curious for, for people, like myself who, you know, that was part of the, that's in the years your brain is forming. Like that was a, that was a key part of my brain developing as a preteen going into teenage years. Um, what can people do who maybe had an unhealthy addiction or an unhealthy kind of relationship with porn? What, what are things they can do like short of therapy to help combat a, you know, pornography addiction or um, even the side effects. Like I know some people, um, you know, report feeling angrier or feeling more stressed because of consumption of porn. Like what, what, what's the step someone should take who hasn't hit the stop button before this gets started? Yeah. Well, the good news is that neuroplasticity is something that applies to our brains forever. Hmm. And so if you're a person that has, developed um, an unhealthy habit or a compulsive behavior or if you label it an addiction with pornography, the good news is that your brain can rewire back. Mm. And you've probably heard the phrase, it's very common, um, cells that uh, fire together, wire together. Yeah. And so that's basically sums up neuroplasticity is when you engage with anything your brain is changing when you learn something new your brain is changing right if you think about for example um, someone that's learning the guitar and they're learning the e chord the the reason why they get better with practice is because they're they're creating new pathways in the brain mm. 
And so the same concept applies in unhealthy ways. It, it applies in healthy ways. And so the answer, the simple answer is to start to fire brain cells together in healthy ways. Meaning um, one important thing if, is going to be to stop consuming pornography because um, when you're talking about neuroplasticity, one thing that's important to talk about is flow. You said that you're a creative individual, right? So you understand flow. Yeah. It's those moments where you're dialed in. Yeah. Right. It's two and in the morning after I get my Taco Bell and I sit down on my computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're dialed in and um, sleep isn't important at that time. Yeah. Right. Nothing right. is in the way of your flow. Right. And what you're doing to your brain at that time, you're, you're using it for healthy things. Right. Um, but what's occurring in your brain at that time during flow is change. And so if you think about a person that is engaged um, with pornography at 2 a.m. rather than creative juices and putting forth good content that's healthy and productive, um, that same person is in a state of flow as well. When, they're, when they have multiple screens, multiple tabs open and they're searching for that perfect scene of pornography, it's the same state of flow that scientists talk about. And so you're molding your brain. And so the first step to rewiring the brain and going back to a healthy state is going to be to stop consuming pornography. And that's easier said than done for a lot of people, for a lot of circumstances. Um, I think if I could give advice to someone who is struggling with pornography that has tried again and again and again and again to stop and hasn't had much success, it would be to that. I think the first, one of the first keys is honesty. Mm. Oftentimes when we're turning again and again and again to a habit or to a behavior, to a substance, um, it's because we are lying. There's deception there in some, in some form. And so whether that deception is to yourself or to other people, um, honesty is key. I, at least in my experience, I used to consume a lot of pornography and, um, I, the, for me, the very first step was honesty. Oh, actually the first step was education for me. And then after that, it was telling the truth. So I was, I was consuming pornography bef behind my um, spouse's back. Like the deception was there. She didn't know that I was consuming pornography. Mm -hmm. And so the deception was there. Once I became educated, I was similar to you where I didn't have many discussions about the harmful effects of pornography growing up. Um, but through six years of marriage, I was consuming porn. Um, I got educated by chance. And then I told the truth to myself and to my spouse um, and that really helped me. So um, the cool thing, I think a lot of people are scared to admit that they have had a challenge with pornography. Right. And the cool thing that I can say today is that I think I'm a better husband and father today right. um, than I was when I had that deception, right. uh, when I was engaged in that deception. So um, honestly, and it empowers me to talk to my kids in a different way because my yeah. kids they we talk openly about this stuff and, and we do it in healthy ways um but the fact that i've had this challenge and rewired my brain to a healthy state um it allows and empowers me to have healthy conversations with my kids so right i'm kind right. of proud of my challenge yeah no definitely um and, and so you, you know you mentioned obviously like telling your spouse and i'm curious is there is there anything that and this is one of my listeners asked this question. That's really good. Is, is, is there something that you can do as the partner of someone with a pornography addiction or someone who is struggling with, with consuming far too much, you know, at the, at the least, um, you know, what, what is something a spouse can do to kind of help their partner in that fight? That's tough. I've never been in that situation, you know, so I'm no, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk about right. that. Um, I was on the other end. I was the spouse consuming. Um, I think if my wife were here, um, and she were talking, I think she would say that, um, boundaries are important. Um, taking care of yourself. If the person doesn't want to change, then no matter what the partner does, if the, if the other partner isn't willing to put in the work, then it's just not going to work. Right. And so, um, that's a thing. And then, uh, but going back to boundaries, I think that, um, yeah, like it, what the person experiences oftentimes is betrayal trauma. 
hmm. the, the spouse on the other end. Like they're cheating almost. The trauma. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. in a relationship, if a person is married or in a, in an exclusive relationship, they have this, like this social contract that says, I'm only going to be with you yeah. and I'm going to be honest. And then if there's deception there and there's, um, other things there, then, uh, it can break that social contract and it can create betrayal trauma for the other person. And so I think the the number one thing would be kind of that example of put your oxygen mask on first. I, I'm sure that my wife would say that's one of the first things to do is mm. you need to take care of yourself. Um, his problem is his problem or her problem is her problem, depending on the gender. And uh, you can influence it, but you can't work through their problem for them. So Right. And, um, and again, this is one other off the cuff question, but I know a couple of people in my group when I mentioned I was going to be doing this interview asked, but so I did a poll in my group. Uh, so 1.3 thousand members. And then um, there was about almost 300 votes on this. Um, but I just said, you know, give your, you know, give your reason in the comments if you want, um, but is porn harmful? Uh, 207 votes said yes. Uh, 66 said depends. 24 said no, and two said unsure. And most of the ones that were no or depends or even unsure, the the comments seem to be pretty frequently like, oh, well, it's it can be wrong in certain circumstances, like depending on the type. Or um, the other one that came up very commonly was, it, I think it's wrong if you're doing it privately, but if it's with your spouse or if it's like something that couples do to, you know, spice things up or things like that. Um, so have you guys done any um, kind of looking into that? And cause I mean, a lot of people that is where they say that they consume porn is with a spouse or a partner. Um, and could you maybe speak into that and how that can be potentially harmful as well um, in that dynamic? Yeah. Um, two things came to mind. There was a researcher named Harry Harlow. And in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of uh, scientists believed that the babies were attached to their mothers because the mothers gave them food. And Harlow and others argued that like comfort and companionship and love played a role hmm. in that attachment. And Harlow was right that um so i think that can be related to pornography because um you could say that pornography is going to be there's short-term gratification there yeah. right but you're going to lack things like companionship and comfort and love um so that's one thing that i would say another thing that came to mind was julian john gottman and julian john gottman they run the gottman institute in washington does the name Malcolm Gladwell ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote a book called Blink. And in the book Blink, they use a lot of research from Julian John Gottman. Mm. Julian John Gottman, they have worked with, over, they have over 40 years of experience. They've worked with thousands of couples during those 40 years. And for a long time, they wouldn't talk to the harmful effects of pornography. Um, I think that in many cases, they would say that... Um, Back in the day, they would say, yes, it can be helpful to certain couples. But recently they came out with a, um, it's called an open letter on pornography. And Julian John Gottman did their institute, the Gottman Institute. And you can find this letter online. And in the letter, I will quote, because I just know this by, by heart because I present um, often. And so the quote is that we are led to unconditionally conclude that for many reasons, pornography poses a serious threat to couple intimacy and relationship harmony. Hmm. And so they have a focus on relationships. Um, that's what they do. And so their, that quote, their studies, their research it all, is all focused on relationships, not, not so much individuals that aren't in relationships, but for those listeners who uh, said no, or it depends, I think that you should definitely consider the Gottman's research because they are world renowned. And um, like they said, it's they're led to unconditionally conclude that it does affect yeah. the harmony of a relationship. So, um, yeah. And porn can be an escalating behavior. We've kind of touched on that yeah. already, but it, it's just something that um, it might it might help once, but then the fifth time, 
it's might not be so healthy. So yeah. And then, yeah. Or eventually it's, Oh, I don't even need my partner because I have this or so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and I just, I also recorded a conversation recently um, for the work I do. And this individual, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is erectile dysfunction, porn induced mm -hmm. erectile dysfunction. Yeah. And so the concept, when I say that porn can be an escalating behavior, that can be, it's the concept of more and more often and a more hardcore version or a more specific yeah. version to get the same level of, of, of dopamine in the brain. And so when, when we're talking about um, pornography within relationships, um, it can actually cause, there's, there's research and there's to show that it can be, there's something called porn-induced ED. So uh, the yeah. person, the person that I spoke to that I was recording the conversation with, they could get an erection with pornography a hundred percent of the time and only 50% of the time with their partner. Wow. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. And that you hit on this to the escalation, but like I, I actually listened to an interview with, uh, with Bill Maher when he was on Joe Rogan's show and, and he's talked about it a lot. I, I follow Bill Maher quite a bit and he talks about how much he dislikes. Um, he, he doesn't have a problem with, Porn, but he has an issue with like the current state and he said the escalation he talks about escalation he says like now it's hard to find porn that is not rapey and aggressive and uh, extreme in some way and he just said it's not you know he said the same thing is like back in the 70s and 80s it was like you know okay oh it's two people having sex wow you know and then he said now there's just been a constant need to basically they have to increase everything about it and elevate everything to meet the demand of the people consuming because what was exciting and new is not so exciting and new anymore. And it yeah. just keeps going into this really far bizarre kind of direction. So right. yeah, I think that's, I think that's interesting. You're talking to a libertine, but I do not think porn is benign. Well, I do not. It is not benign. Not, the, not the, the way it is now on the computer. I mean, it's, it's rapey. It's um, it's it's what a tough sites. Are you going to any any site? I'm not getting the rapey porn, but well, I think it's well, not it's, benign because oh, please, it's not it's not it's domineering. Yes, it's a lot of things that I am not interested in, even in my fantasies. I was doing a, a bit about that in my last special. Like even in my fantasies, I don't want to choke anybody. Yeah. I I don't want to on your face. I mean, come on, on your face. That that's not. <laughs> rapey or domineering or i mean i i find that off-putting and gross it doesn't that doesn't move me and the thing i don't get it but that's half of what pornhub is well i think what half of it is now is a lot of stepsister stuff it's like stepfather that, stepsister what's step that brother. all about because people are trying to be naughty and there's nothing naughty left because like the idea right. of porn originally was like, i can't believe these people are having sex like go back and watch porn from the 80s so they're it's... just having sex Choking mm -hmm. on spitting. your face, spitting. Yeah, yeah, it's gross, and it's it, and so uh, I'm not surprised that kids have mental problems. Good ideas of sex. Yeah. Yes, if one thing that came to mind as you were talking is that another risk when it comes to pornography that people should know about as they are making their educated decision on to consume it or not is um, we talked a little bit about neuroplasticity, but one of the leading experts on neuroplasticity is Dr. Norman Doidge. Okay. And he wrote a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. And <clears throat> he, he talks about how pornography can mold a person's sexual tastes. Hmm. And that those, basically, it says that the, so I'll just read this quote because okay. it's, it's powerful. It says, sexual tastes are molded by an individual's experiences and their culture. These tastes are acquired and then wired into the brain when we are unable, we are unable to distinguish our second nature from our original nature because our neuroplastic brains once rewired develop a new nature every bit as biological as the original. And so hmm. what he's saying there is that our brain, because our brain is always changing, um, our sexual tastes can change and can be molded by our experiences and our culture. And so wow. that's one risk is like, like you said, you go down these rabbit holes with pornography and then you're looking for more and more often a more hardcore version. And um, that can literally change your, your sexual taste. So it's right. just a risk you need to know about as you make an educated decision. Right. 
Well, uh, look, I mean, I appreciate you talking through this and I, I have to ask this last question because the nature of my show tends to deal so much with abuse specifically. Um, and so porn is, is a key instrument used in many cases of sexual abuse, um, especially involving children. Uh, when, I, when I spoke with uh, Dr. Kelly Palfi, who wrote the book Men Too, which is an awesome book for anyone listening that hasn't checked it out, um, a lot of older predators will show pornography to the victims to kind of normalize sex acts. Do you guys have any research on this and how uh, porn is used in cases like this? Or um, is this something that you see frequently uh, when doing research? Um, so off the top of my head, I don't have any empirical evidence, but, um, I do have some anecdotal evidence that I can talk to a little bit. And I recently read a book called groomed. It's by Samantha Leonard. Hmm. She was a victim of, um, childhood abuse, um, sexual abuse, and her perpetrator did use pornography to, to groom. It was part of the grooming process. If you think about tar, um, the grooming process, targeting, gaining trust, filling a need, um, isolating the child and then introducing sexual contact of some sort. Pornography can definitely play a role. Another study actually that just came to mind um, that is more empirical evidence is that there was a study done in Spain that they looked at um, perpetrators who had um, had offended, sexually abused other people and these perpetrators were adolescents and of the in this study 70 percent of the perpetrators reported having an early onset of pornography consumption wow and so i think that there's correlation there once again it's not causation right but yeah there that's one variable that did appear often that those perpetrators were consuming pornography at an early age right right yeah that's interesting um no i yeah, like I said, I, I think um, reading a lot of these anecdotal accounts, I think, is helpful. And studies like that, I mean, obviously, you can't say that's 100% responsible, but you can't separate it entirely from the equation. Everything has to be accounted for. But yeah, I just want to ask you that because that's something I hear commonly through the testimonies I hear and the conversations I have. So I wanted to get your your take on that. But um uh, but no, I, I appreciate you, like I said, coming on the show and taking a, an hour to talk about this. And I know you're, you're spending countless hours talking about this, so I guess it's not too far out of the way. But um, you know, I know my audience is going to appreciate it. I think it's going to lead to some good conversation. Um, what's, so if someone's going to go check out Fight the New Drug, obviously I'll list the website and everything in the, in the description. But for someone who's new to your organization, what's the best place for them to start getting to know you guys? Um, is it I know there's a documentary that you guys have put out. Uh, there's the podcast. So maybe just give one or two great ways for people to connect with you and uh, get in touch with you and your mission. Yeah, we have over 5 million um, followers on our social media platforms. And so that's a great place to start. Right. Um, and uh, we also have a tool called the conversation blueprint Um that people can go to it's ftnd.org forward slash blueprint. And this will help people who are wanting to have a conversation about the harmful effects of pornography in an effective way. And so we developed that blueprint uh, for those people. And then also you mentioned the documentary. It's a great tool. It's a brainheartworld.org and you can watch it for free. It's three parts brain, how it affects the brain, the world uh, and relationships. What do you think the secret to happiness is? I think pedicures are the, are the key to happiness. <laughs> I think mostly being with my family makes me happy. I find happiness by being with people. Brand new. I was 10 years old when I first saw pornography. I had to watch at least once, twice a day. That's where it all just kind of got out of control. Everything that we do each and every day shapes our brain. So if I watch a lot of porn, I will train my brain regions responsible for porn processing a lot more. I think my view of love before, um, I I probably even said this on multiple occasions, is love doesn't exist. Because of porn, we're literally bonding with the screen. There isn't pornography over here and trafficking over there. They're interlinked. There have been over 50 studies showing a direct link between pornography and sexual violence. So the first time he raped me, I noticed that there was a video camera set up in his closet. 
Many of the women who are in the production of pornography are actually victims of sex trafficking. I became the most popular male adult film star of all time. You know, sex meant nothing to me. I was cold as stone. Describe love in single words. I think love is understanding. Love is patient. Compassion. Love is complicated and sometimes miserable. This is gonna be I'm much happier without the porn. I never thought anybody would want me after everything that I had been through. I found purpose and passion. I love my life now. After I was rescued, I have become an advocate against pornography, and I'm happy now. It is possible to experience real love. Uh, those are three options to to look into. We also have thousands of blogs to right. look at. So, um, yeah, yeah, no one's going to run out of content for sure. There's a lot of stuff from the last several years uh, that's very helpful. So, but uh, yeah, definitely, guys, check that out. Uh, I'll put all the links to everything in the show notes. Might throw in a couple extra uh, as well, and then obviously all the books you mentioned. I'll I'll throw links to as well in case people want to check those out. But um, Garrett, yeah, thanks so much for, for coming on the show and taking time to talk with me and uh, hope to sometime off to grab some Jimmy John's, bring it by the office for you and your <laughs> boss and uh, <laughs> we'll have to for meet sure, up in Utah yeah. at some point. But yeah, uh, I know that our bo- uh, I know that Clay would love that because yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's uh, a big fan of Jimmy John's. Yeah, he's a bit, that was an inside joke for those not knowing anything about you guys, but I know that that would probably pay <laughs> off sure. well. But uh, yeah, sure. no, thanks for thanks. coming on. I'll let you uh, get to it today. But uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for all you guys are doing too. You guys are great. So we appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.